Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show. Today's episode is a retro review. I'm going to take a look at Ad- uh, Adventure Comics from DC Comics, uh, issue 459. Uh, this is a, this is an issue that uh, in real time, I just read recently, or just finished recently. Uh, I bought the issue, boy, uh, probably two or three years ago. I decided I wanted a run of adventure comics that included the um, the uh, the uh, cosmic Starman, um, and in and in and in uh, looking at the issues in which the Starman appeared, uh, I found the um, the adventure comics line that had a bunch of different characters, and issue four fifty nine started that, and so this was the the beginning of the Dollar Comics version of uh, Adventure Comics. Uh, the previous issue, 458, I believe was a 35-cent comic. And so then 459 jumps up to a dollar, but you get 68 pages, it says on the cover. 68 pages, but that only that includes the cover. It's actually a 64-page comic. But no ads. And you have, uh, as it says here, six all-new superstar features. And it lists at the very top of the trade dress Flash, Wonder Woman, and Dead Man, but you have, who, who are also on the cover here, pr- featured prominently, but you also have as the fourth, in, uh, fourth installment, uh, the, the fourth regular character feature, and that is Green Lantern. And you have, like I said, you have these four, four characters running at us uh, uh, in the middle of the, of the cover here, just a plain white background. And then at the bottom to fill out the six is uh, Elongated Man, a, a, a story featuring him and his wife, and a headshot of Darkseid, because there is a New Gods feature in this comic. Also on the, on the, on the cover, um, some <laughs> selling blurbs, some... Uh, some things to get you to buy it, I guess. Uh, so on the left is, if you buy only one comic this month, this must be the one. And I, I was thinking, boy, if I were a kid at that time, well, I was a kid at that time. If I were, if I were a comic buying kid at that time, uh, which I, was I? When did this come out? Ooh, this came out. So yeah, this would have been a comic that I would have... Nope, I wouldn't have seen it. Actually, it was right before, right before I started getting comics regularly. So this is uh, cover dated October 1978. So it came out, according to Mike's Amazing World of Comics, on June 13th, 1978. And I bought my first set of comics that launched me into being a comic book lover and later podcaster about comics. Um in September of 1978. So, so while the cover date, while the cover date actually in the in, in Dicia, uh is September slash October, so because it was printed by monthly, uh, it was uh, just a few months before I started actually uh, buying comics regularly. But as I said, it's it's a dollar comic. Uh, just imagine, you know, if you were reading uh, adventure comics, buying adventure comics for 35 cents, and then suddenly it goes up to a dollar. You could imagine down the road what this possibly could mean, and indeed you might be right, uh, because the dollar format did not last as long as I think they wanted it to. I have seven issues, or sorry, eight counting Adventure 459, eight issues of this, where it was a dollar comic. So, uh, and then it went, and then it went back to, um, with issue 467. And that's when they started the, the Starman run that I wanted to, that, that launched me on this, this path to get a bunch of adventure comics, um, Starman and plastic man. So see how that goes, because once I get to those comics, uh, I'm not a big fan of plastic man. So uh, I find it ironic that the first issue of Adventure Comics, uh, starting this run that I have, features what I think of as the the uh, the better stretchy guy, elongated man. 
Anyway, uh, at the bottom of the page next to Elongated Man is the, 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 co- the cover blurb text uh, featuring his story. It says, The Elongated Man Cracks the $1,000 Fortune Cookie Mystery. Um, on the on the right side of uh, the cover, uh, you know, to try and get you to buy it, uh, also is this uh, kind of explosive um, graphic here. Uh, but uh, or what do you what do you call those? Uh, um, dialogue box? No, it's not a dialogue box. It's a anyway. It's a jagged design. <laughs> <laughs> blanket on what the what, what do you call those things uh but it says a fabulous first issue launching the most exciting new comic of the decade of the decade <laughs> that's uh that's uh, boy that's really uh trying to sell it huh um and then below that like i said uh, you have dark side's face here uh, uh and it says the last battle dark side's showdown with the new gods and so uh what that is is uh as the has the introductory text on the uh, back front cover and the inside back cover. Uh, this is uh, by Paul Levitz, the editor of this particular comic. Uh, Paul is spelling out what this all is, what this new adventure comics venture is all about. And uh, the New Gods thing is two stories that would have appeared in the New Gods comic book that was canceled. And so we're getting the end of that story that uh, that was started. And so that was in- interesting. And it turns out uh, because the, uh, for example, Green Lantern, who is who is one of the regular stars of this lineup, uh, he does not, he, at that time, he didn't have his own comic. Uh, so they wanted to bring uh, bring him into this. Um, and some of the other things that are going on with this. The reason they chose the characters they did, I mean, it, for example, The Flash, you know, still had his comic at that time. Uh, that hadn't gone away, uh, which makes sense why he's, you know, he gets, essentially gets top billing here. You know, he's listed first. He's featured slightly more prominently along with Wonder Woman on the cover. Uh, they both have their comics. Green Lantern doesn't, as I said. Dead Man. I believe this was the first regular feature of the character since 1969 if i uh, read that correctly somewhere uh so you know that's kind of the reasons why they want to do it but they wanted to focus on for flash and wonder woman well green lantern 2 i'll get to that for flash they wanted to uh, instead of focusing on the as they say here the central city slash supporting cast oriented epics uh, these stories will concentrate on aspects of the fastest man alive that have been ignored the past few years. Future storylines include journeys uh, to far off times and dimensions and explorations of the unique powers that make Barry Allen the Flash. So really selling what uh, if, if you're, you know, if, a, if you're a, fa- a Flash, if you are a Flash fan, ugh, uh, alliteration kills me sometimes, you get to experience slightly different things than you would in his regular comic, which I think is a really cool concept. Uh, they also do that uh, with Wonder Woman. So as it says here, while Diana's own magazine focuses on her new career as an astronaut trainee, which I vaguely remember, uh, but I, I haven't been a, um, a particular Wonder Woman reader until more recent decades. <laughs> so, um, I don't really know anything about that whole astronaut trainee thing, which makes me want to go find out more. Um, and the science fiction plot lines that spawns from that, I guess, her adventures in adventure comics will pay more attention to the mythological background that makes her unique among our superstars. Uh, and featuring her in action against supervillains she has never fought, and which indeed happens in this premiere issue. And uh, like like I was saying about before about Green Lantern, his is a little different. He doesn't have his own comic, but what they want to do here is put him through a series of explorations and adventures that would be wholly impossible if Green Arrow was in the series. And uh, it also says regular artist Joe Staten gets to fulfill a lifelong dream by illustrating these epics. It says also as of this writing, we will, we are not certain who will script subsequent sto- subsequent stories. Of Green Lantern, which seems rather odd, but I guess, you know, this being a bi-monthly book, they have a little bit of time to figure that out, um, which is, I don't know, 
given how comics are produced these days where you double ship and all that stuff, it just seems kind of weird now uh, that they used to uh, produce comics uh, so haphazardly. Uh, But anyway, um, let's see here. Uh, Like I said, they have Elongated Man. Uh, which they say is uh, this. It's an elongated. It's a seven-page short story, elongated man short story. Uh, it, <laughs> Paul says it's an amusing counterpoint to the New Gods epic, which I guess um, I, I I'm not sure why. I mean, I, I th- it's a very tenuous connection, uh, I guess, to fill up some space in in this uh, this cover inside cover stuff that he's uh, where he's introducing everything. Um, Interestingly, interestingly, though, once they conclude the New Gods stuff, the following issue, it says uh, they will begin a new series entitled The Man Called Neverwhere by Roger McKenzie and Don Newton. And they have a bunch of other ideas for these uh, two rotating slots, as, as it says here. Uh, the litany of other ideas that have been proposed for these two slots is almost endless and will and will provide one of the mainstays will keep Adventure Comics surprising every issue. Unfortunately, that didn't quite pan out the way they planned. Uh, but boy, what what an interesting idea if they had if they if they had continued with that. Um, the the man called Neverwhere, which boy, is, talk about an intriguing title, uh, n- <laughs> never appeared. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as far as I know. So um, boy, I wonder what that was about. And uh, since I'm still talking about the cover, I wanted to point your attention to the back cover if you go look this up. And I'll I'll include the the cover images here uh, uh, on the the blog post for this. So it's got six squares, you know, featuring these six adventures that we get. And, we you know, one panel each, different colors to call your attention to what's going on here. Some of them kind of give you an idea of the story that you're about to read. I guess, well, except for Green Lantern. I mean, kind of Green Lantern, not really. He's probably the the one that doesn't really reflect what the story is really about. Uh, New Gods too, a little bit, but but the rest of them are very particular about the what's going on in the particular stories here. So I thought that was a neat little addition, a way to sell this book if you looked at the back cover. So anyway, let's let's dive into this. Uh, we get the Flash, the Crimson Comets of Fallville High, uh, by Carrie Bates, Irv Novik, Frank McLaughlin, Jasper Saladino, and Jean uh, D'Angelo. So uh, this is it opens up very weirdly because um, Flash is running across country to go to a high school reunion, and he comes across a a parachuter whose parachute is not working. <laughs> so he saves the guy. It's 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 a splash page and three more panels, and then he moves on. And so it, anyway, like like I said, it's it's the fifteenth year reunion of Fallville High. Uh, and that's, you know, I've, I've never been a, a big Flash fan, so I really don't know a lot about the history of the character, uh, the personal history, I mean. And uh, I had no idea that he went to a place called Fallville. You know, it's 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 just too close to Smallville for, for Superman. I don't know. It's just, it seems very weird. Uh, one of the characters in here uh, Rachel, she plays a, a, a pivotal role in this story, but she refers to the slow and lazy Barry Allen. And again, like I said, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about uh, Barry Allen's history, but I thought the whole slow and lazy Barry Allen thing was more, uh, more like, more like Clark Kent being the, the bumbling. Uh, persona of Superman, I thought that the the slow and lazy part of Barry Allen was to help hide the fact that he was the Flash. I didn't realize it was part of his character before he became the Flash, or at least according to this story. But uh, uh, Rachel, it turns out, is a bit of a psychic. And she tells one of her other classmates, for some reason, um, who, who, what's his, what's his character's name? Tony. Tony and, and Barry have some words, but then Rachel pulls Barry aside, or sorry, Tony aside, and says, 
uh, one of our former classmates is secretly the Flash, and I know which one. And so Tony tells her uh, to tell him who it is, which apparently she does. And then Tony sets a trash can on fire outside the gymnasium where the reunion is going on, and uh, which causes the Flash to go into action to stop, literally stomp out the fire. Uh, which confirms that to Tony that the fastest man alive is standing only a few feet away from us. And so then he calls the head man. (laughs) Uh, I think he's some sort of gangster or something, I guess. I mean, it sounds like that. But anyway, Tony knocks out Barry Allen, who is talking to this this, uh, classmate named Nathan. And uh, Tony, like I said, Tony knocks out Barry and and pulls a gun on Nathan because Rachel thought that Nathan was the Flash. And the reason we find out that Nathan, or Rachel thinks that Nathan is the Flash, is that he's uh, Nathan is a struggling actor, and he'll begin, as he says, I'll begin the most challenging TV role of my career, portraying the Flash. And he's 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 so intent on, well. As he says here, I'll just I'll just read this. Since I belong to the method school of acting, I try to actually live my parts as much as possible in preparation. I even have a flash uniform in case, in my suitcase back at the motel. Uh, I practice posing in in it in front of a mirror every chance I get. Which is, I don't know, but I don't know much about the method school of acting other other than than the, you know the actors uh, really are supposed to embody the role at all times. Uh, I don't know that posing in a costume in in front of a mirror is really part of that. You know, it could be, I suppose. Uh, I guess if you, any of you are actors out there, you, you would, uh, you can let me know that, but I just, it just, it just seems really odd that he poses um, <clears throat> in this, in this costume uh, in the mirror. But anyway, uh, Barry's on their trail and instead of just taking out Tony, uh, and then threat of his gun, uh, he decides to make, at least at first, make Tony believe that Nathan is the Flash. I'm not sure why that is. So Flash goes back, uh, speeds back to the motel, gets this perfect replica of his co- his own costume, which, you know, amazingly done for a TV show. <laughs> Uh, and then proceeds to put uh, strip na- his classmate Nathan of his clothing, put the costume on him, all all so fast that he's invisible, and and then proceeds to make it look like Nathan is doing these feet, these super speed feats. Again, I'm not sure why until the very end. I think me, I think Barry just has a macabre sense of humor because once he takes care of the the, the gangsters coming to, I guess, take out the flash or whatever. Then he appears next to Nathan, uh, to which Tony says, good grief, another flash. (laughs) Nathan pulls off his mask and says, no, you idiot. That's the real flash. (laughs) Tony's not exactly firing in all cylinders. But anyway, uh, you know, ends, ends all well, I guess. Um, uh, oh, I guess uh, so. Apparently, Tony was doing this because he he was indebted to you know somebody, but he will now get proper police protection. Nathan somehow knows. Anyway, so uh, and, and Barry tells Nathan, "Hey, just be a brilliant Scarlet Speedster. That ought to be thanks enough to the Flash." So th- that's the other odd thing about this is that the Flash is so popular in the DC universe that he. There's a TV special or a TV series. It wasn't quite clear what was going on there, but uh, and the story ends with uh, Rachel doing her best, Lois Lane, because maybe at the next reunion I'll find out who actually is the Flash. Uh, there you go. So a nice little twelve-page story, and then we get uh, Dead Man. Uh, so who's this by? This is uh, Murder Haunts the Midway. Is the name of the story. Uh, this is by Lynn Ween, Jim Apero. Or Aparo. I heard somebody on a podcast recently pronounce it, but I've always pronounced it Aparo. I wonder who is correct here. And Glennis Ween doing the colors. So Aparo has always been one of my favorite uh, early early to my reading of DC Comics artists. 
uh, mostly because of his Batman and the, and the Outsiders. But uh, at times here, because it just you know, just, it just says artist Jim Apparel, so apparently he's inking himself. And there are times when he looks a little bit like Neil Adams when Neil Adams was doing the Dead Man stuff, which I thought was nice. But uh, so they open up this new storyline with Dead Man at uh, the circus. Um, which circus is it? Hills Circus. And so he's basically haunting the circus uh, and keeping an eye on things. And his brother, Cleveland, um, has taken on uh, his act as as the acrobatic dead man. And um, uh, Boston brand uh, dead man himself decides that he's going to take his brother's body for a ride and, you know, to do the to do the act because, you know. He doesn't think that his brother can do it or something. I don't know, it's kind of creepy the way, <laughs> how he just takes over his brother's body. But uh, what happens is we get a little reenactment of Boston's murder because somebody shoots Cleveland. And it's and it's only because of uh, uh, Boston's sixth sense about this that, he, that his brother's able to survive the shooting. But then, of course, that puts Boston on to who tried to kill his brother and he runs, he, he quickly finds the guy and inhabits uh, the bodies of a few different people, but that doesn't go so great. And then uh, finally he, he decides that I'm going to, I'm going to go into the, the body of this guy. But what's interesting is that, so he's like, all I have to do now is walk this body down to the nearest police station, evidence in hand, and let the boys in blue handle all the, huh? something's wrong this body is fighting me and basically the guy puts the gun to uh, his own head and and kills himself which is weird uh because uh, for the most part every time i've read a dead man story the the person being inhabited doesn't really have a choice in the matter uh i mean they can fight him but it usually boston is able to you know fully inhabit the body and control it but so i thought that was weird but you know maybe this is setting up something to come some other force that uh that uh boston dead man has to has to um engage with and as it says to be continued you better believe it and then we get uh the the green lantern story so at this point, uh, Hal Jordan is a truck driver, uh, one of his many jobs uh, that they experimented with, um, and he is driving a truck full of explosives, and it says very plainly on the side of the truck, explosives, <laughs> which, I don't know, see, you know, in today's post-9-11 world, um, seems rather odd that they, you know, I can imagine a truck driving down any freeway saying explosives just seems like, you know, it's just a big target. But anyway, this is back in the late seventies where we didn't worry about things like that so much. But, um, as he's driving along this, this, uh, alien woman appears in front of him. Oh, I'm sorry. This is called the call of the cosmos by, uh, Carrie Burkett, uh, Joe Staten, Ben Oda and Adrian Roy. Anyway, this, this, uh, this female alien appears in front of him. He uh, he's about ready to hit this woman, but uh, he so uses his ring to f- uh, form a bridge that goes up and over her, and he gets out and she's disappeared. Well, he decides he's gonna he's going to investigate, so he does his oath, takes off uh, as Green Lantern, uh, follows this trail to a spaceship uh, where the ship is under attack by these energy draining aliens in space. And uh, Hal quickly finds that these these aliens are draining his ring's power, which, you know, got to be careful of that. So how does he resolve this? Um, he says, wait a minute, I just realized part of my willpower has already been diverted to make a shield for my for my rig, the, the truck full of explosives, which he had done before he left. If I can concentrate on that energy, I can bring the truck up to me. And since the truck is loaded with explosives, when it hits one of the creatures, it should... Blacoom, as the sound effect uh, says, takes care of uh, 
the energy creatures attacking him and he goes into the spaceship. So, okay, first of all, uh, there's a couple things in here where Hal is, is pretty cavalier. Uh, and this is a, this is one of the big ones, you know, so he's the truck driver of this truck full of explosives. I assume this is a, this is a, uh, a very expensive load that he's carrying that he just, just destroys. So how does he explain that? <laughs> <laughs> to his employers and to the uh, customer of those explosives. Uh, anyway, um, I'm really curious now as I read through the rest of these issues if that will actually pan out or if they'll just ignore it. Or maybe he goes on to the next job because he's he's uh, been summarily fired. I mean, when, when they prosecute him for, I don't know. I guess it depends on the story he tells. But anyway, he goes into uh, the alien ship and meets the 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 woman who asked for his assistance and it's it's very interesting this is uh this this character design she's a, a she's an orange skin alien with this flowing reddish well i guess it's 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 reddish it's reddish hair but um looks very much like a, a, a um uh, uh she looks very much like uh starfire from the new teen titans uh, very close look so i thought that was interesting but the reason the whole reason uh, that this alien woman contacted green liner wasn't because she was in danger i mean she was but the whole reason that she was trying to contact him was uh i came here looking for you green liner because you see i love you i've loved you from the day you visited my world of chateau chateau when you saved us from the great flood Millions were grateful to you, but somehow I felt more. I knew I had to see you again. That's why I volunteered for an exploratory mission that would take me to your space sector. Um, however, I did in the in the course of the journey, I had not anticipated encountering the, the energy leeches, and so then they're attacked again by those energy leeches. So, how quickly takes care of them because he. Uh, the 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 woman makes a, a comment about not even the freezing vacuum of space does not harm them, and so he uses a heat blast from his ring to ward them off, I guess. And then he comes back into the ship and then blasts the woman, and it turns out the reason he did that is because uh, that was a hologram, and so he demand he demands angrily demands to see the real alien and she comes in and she looks nothing like well she's colored similarly but she's not as quote unquote beautiful as she was uh, been as she was shown earlier she's got antenna um uh, as as is as was the penchant for sh- for drawing aliens or as is the penchant you know she doesn't really have a nose she's got uh, little slits where her nose is big eyes i mean she's cute um, but she's crying. I think there's even, I don't know if that's, that's not coming out of her nose from crying or just, or just, that's just the, the nostrils. But anyway, I, she says, I was afraid if you saw what I really look like, you'd, you'd be repulsed and Hal smiles a little bit, which creepy. He says repulsed, puts his hands on her and then kisses her. This story does not age well. Uh, he says, I'm a Green Lantern. Many of us have given up loves to continue in that duty, for few can commit themselves to both. I am not one of those few, and if I were, there is one named Carol Ferris who has her claim on my heart, but I will never forget your love that came across a galaxy to find me. And, oof, boy. Way to, I don't know. A mercy kiss, Hal? I, it just, this really, that, uh, this really bugs me. Um, not the best story. Uh, uh, and it ends, it gets even worse. He says, it's worth having to replace my rig and cargo. How, 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 how are you going to do that for just one kiss like that? I just, ugh. I love, I love Hal Jordan. I love Green Lantern. But boy, this is not his best moment. Okay. <laughs> uh, next is the, uh, the New God story. And this is uh, Climax of Chaos by Jerry Conway, Don Newton, Augie Scotto, Ben Oda, and Jerry Serpy. And um, 
at first I did not recognize Don Newton when I, when I was looking at this, um, because the inks, the, the, uh, who was it? Uh, Aguiscado inks. Uh, it reminds me of something else that I can't place. I just, I can't place the artist that I'm thinking of. Uh, cause normally Don Newton's not my favorite artist, generally speaking, but with, uh, with um, the inker here, I I actually quite like it. But uh, this is clearly uh, you. I mean, I had no idea about when I when I read the story. I didn't know about the um, the fact that this was a continuation of something from the New Gods title. And but as I was reading, I was it's very clearly a continuation of that because you got a bunch of supporting characters that show up at the beginning, and they're referred to uh, a little bit later. But uh, it says here at the very at the very top of the page. It began in the early seventies as Jack Kirby's Fourth World trilogy, New Gods, Mister Miracle, and the Forever People. Then those magazines were canceled, and the series lay dormant for years until it was recently reborn. Now it is our privilege to present the concluding adventures in this epic war of worlds. See, I didn't read that. <laughs> I just assumed it was, and, and I assumed correctly it, that it was a um, a synopsis of of this thing. Uh, much like they, they had, um, like the, like the flash, you know, the, the very top of the, of the, of the flash story, uh, it says a bolt of lightning shattered a cabinet of chemicals, changing police scientist, Barry Allen into the fa- fastest man alive, the flash. So I assume that that little blurb at the top of this new God story was similar, just kind of introducing you to the characters and, and letting you know, you know, what this is about. Generally speaking, did not realize it was. That until I read the the back uh, cover blurb from Paul Levitz, and then then I came back and read that again. Anyway, that's my fault as a reader. Make sure you read everything on the page, folks. That's I guess that's the moral of the story. But um, you get Orion here, uh, prominently shown, and he's in this. Uh, I've seen this before. It's this red, yellow, and blue costume. It's more of a superhero looking uh, outfit. I don't know because I haven't read the New Gods uh, title. I don't know if that's something that they introduced there or if this is something new for this part of the story. Uh, I'll have to look that up or if anybody knows, they can let me know because I'm, I'm used more used to his, his um, basically his red suit with the helmet, uh, which is not what he's wearing here. Anyway, what I find interesting about this, um, you get a lot of, a lot of background. I think maybe they, they decided to, Give us a little bit more of the background of the situation in this story, just for our benefit, for the adventure comics readers' benefit. Uh, so, a few pages is kind of filled up with basically getting us all caught up. Uh, along the way, Light Ray shows up. What's his name? Uh, Metron uh, Bug is in here, which I've always liked Bug ever since Cosmic Odyssey. Uh, and he's in also in the Young Justice season three series on the DC Universe app, so which I really like. But what's most interesting here? So you know they're supposed to uh, the new gods are supposed to be fighting Darkseid, of course, and uh, Orion is the son of Darkseid. And we get at the very end of this, the last three pages of this story is this uh, confrontation between the uh, father and son and dark side comes across as a bit forlorn. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a side of dark side. I don't think I've ever seen. He is, he seems genuinely sad that his son will not join him and, and is, is going to fight him, continue to fight him. Um, it's, he doesn't, I mean, he does, Darkseid does, you know, he does, he does tell his son, uh, together we can burn worlds, Orion, together we can claim a universe, father and son, we can put this galaxy to the torch, burn out the old weakness, purify the fetid flesh, route out the disease of life, together we can conquer eternity. I, I offer you my hand, Orion, take it. And Orion says, I cannot. And there's a couple panels here where dark side he's had, he has it before this, he had his hand out, uh, out wanting, you know, literally wanting Orion to take it, I guess. And, uh, the second panel shows dark side, closing his hand into a fist, pulling it towards him, looking, looking sad. 
So I, you know, even though, you know, he wants to destroy the universe, essentially, um, he is emotionally affected by his son's rejection, which, like I said, I, I don't know that I've ever seen Dark Side shown that way. I thought that was really interesting. So now I am uh, curious how this story ends. So I'm looking forward to reading issue 460 of Adventure Comics. Uh, now we get to the elongated man story, the case of the fortune cookie fortune. This is interesting because of how many people are involved in this seven page short story. You have one, two, three, four, five writers, five, uh, Len Wein, Paul Levitz, Mike Gold and Delary Gold and Steve Mitchell with art by George Rupert and Bruce Patterson, which, um, I always love Bruce Patterson, Patterson's work, Clem Robbins and Glynis Ween Oliver, uh, rounding out the letterer and colorist respectively. This is a, a bit of a convoluted story. Ralph and Sue are, uh, they've been driving for nine hours. They stop in this little town called Sutterville. I, I, I have to wonder was, is, you know, DC comics just kind of, I mean, they seem to have a thing for Vils, right? So Smallville, Fallville, Sutterville, good Lord. Uh, but anyway, they, they stop and they, 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 uh, Ralph wants some Chinese food. So he stops in to, uh, this, uh, it's called Jethro Pagoda, I guess. Yeah. And it happens to be the restaurant of the mayor of this fair town who recognizes Ralph as the famous elongated man. And so he invites uh, Ralph and Sue to be his guests for dinner. Uh, they get introduced to the maitre d', I guess. Uh, what, what, what do they refer to him as later? Hold on. Oh, the head waiter. Duh. Um, anyway, so they have dinner. And uh, then they op- they're opening uh, fortune cookies. And uh, in- inside there's no fortune there's a thousand dollar bill and everybody, there are about 30 people. Yeah. They, they've, they very explicitly state that we only have tables for 30 people anyway. So apparently there are $30,000 in this restaurant being given away to each individual through these fortune cookies. And of course that gets Ralph's, uh, uh, sleuthing nose, a twitching. And, um, (laughs) he goes, he goes off in his costume, which he just happens to have on, I guess. It's a, it's a weird transition from him being in a suit with no obvious um, uh, costume, but to slipping out, you know, stretching out of his suit and he's wearing, you know, gloves and all. But anyway, that's superhero comics, folks. Um, <laughs> Sue, of course, says, well, there goes the evening. She's not very happy about this, but off he goes to investigate uh, Sue, as she often does helps him with a little bit, pointing him in the right direction, uh, encounters a couple guys who, just to provide a, a bit of uh, antagonism, I guess, um, try to prevent him from going to the airport where he sees this airplane taking off, which contains the head waiter. And he gets in there, he stretches up into uh, the airplane and gets in. And it turns out that the head waiter is actually the famous comedian Benny Maxwell he's who he, and his um, his actual name is Benny Jackson and so he is from Sutterville it's his old hometown uh when he left to pursue his fortune he actually took off with a fortune because when he was just a kid that he uh with a bankroll i sort of um borrowed during my stint as a teller at the Sutterville savings and loan a $30,000 bankroll <laughs> which he was able to repay, but he couldn't, he says, he says he couldn't do that openly. Uh, so he came back to uh, his hometown as Benny Jackson and then gave back to the town the $30,000. Uh, so Ralph being the good guy that he is, um, he he feels that Benny has already faced the music as, as they say, he's done that and uh, leaves Benny to his own devices and he gets back uh or he heads back to town he says it's been over an hour since i've had, had anything to eat and i'm hungry again yuck 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 Ugh. 
I don't know about uh, I don't know about this one. Uh, despite the fact that there are five writers on this, I'm not sure why that would be for like I said, seven pages. But um, it actually, you know, if you if you uh, make certain allowances for the mystery itself and the the payoff, the setup and payoff, which I guess is pretty much the entire story. Now that I'm thinking about it, um, it's not too bad. <laughs> Considering, I guess um, I just I just uh, was tickled that to read an adventure with with Ralph and his his mystery twitch and nose. So I always I always like that aspect of of this character. And then finally we get the uh, Wonder Woman story, and so uh, this actually opens with uh, her mother Hippolyta uh, saying, "Your unasked questions reach me, and I am here to answer." Was Princess Diana chosen to be our emissary to man's world by feats of strength alone, or were there other reasons? Observe, and learn as others learned, the shark's dark demand. This is from uh, Jack C. Harris, Jack Abel, Frank Giacoya, Shelley Lefferman, and Jean D'Angelo. And this is basically a story of the shark encountering Wonder Woman. So uh, uh, fulfilling the promise that uh, Paul Levitz mentioned in the the, the back cover blurb about it, um, featuring her in action against supervillains she has never fought. Uh, we do get a, a recap of, of who the shark is. As he says, I am the shark female, the shark. You'll do well to remember my name. And uh, we get a recap of the shark who is uh, an atomically um, or it says here, a, a stray bolt of atomic energy struck the brain of a tiger shark and sped it through the evolutionary process. And so now he's a, a shark in a uh, man's form who fought Green Lantern, Superman, and Aquaman. And uh, at the end of that Aquaman adventure, apparently he was de-evolved to a shark, but his brain was still evolved. And so he was just a, it was just a matter of time before he evolutionarily sped through and transformed into back into the the man form that he is. Uh, and now he's taking on as Wonder Woman thinks. If you think the members of the Justice League are your personal game preserve, you're dead wrong. And then they fight. Uh, turns out that the shark's mental abilities uh, allows him to control uh, Diana's lasso, uh, which binds her. She gets out of that, but then he chains her with uh, an, an anchor and chain from uh, the depths of the sea because he knows through his mental abilities that uh, if you and this is this is the this is the other thing I was referring to earlier the fact that uh, you know if if Wonder Woman is bound by a man she loses her power, her abilities her super strength specifically here in this story which I never like that I, I hated the whole bondage aspect of wonder woman i know that's part of her history and whatnot from her creator but i what's even worse is the shark isn't isn't attacking diana because he wants to prove his superior abilities (laughs) it gets much worse than that as he says, I evolved through my species evolutionary stages as I did that. I did retain my ancestor's eternal lust for prey, the hunger for destruction, which is what Diana was referring to earlier. But there was another desire, a second primitive drive that brought me to you, female. Ugh, I, the desire to take a mate makes me gag. Uh, and he, you know, he, he grabs her and is pulling her towards him, uh, carrying the still-bound Wonder Woman out uh, off her invisible jet as they land. But Wonder Woman, for some reason, still believes that because she's bound by a man, she doesn't have his strength, but then realizes, thanking Hera, I have the answer, because uh, before he stepped foot on on Paradise Island, but the old adage was, if if a man stepped on Paradise Island, then then all the Amazon Amazons would lose their abilities, lose their powers, as she says. But when sharks set foot on our island, nothing happened. Therefore, he must not be considered by the gods as a man, since he was not born of a woman. And since a true man did not bind me, dun dun dun, I've retained my Amazonian strength. She breaks out of the, her bonds and takes care of the shark, and then uses her lasso to devolve him and to forget 
that he was ever uh, a man shark. Wow. Um, I mean, just set a, set aside the the threatened rape of of Wonder Woman by the shark in the story, which is just really glossed over. As I said, just it's just disgusting. But uh, she also mind wipes the guy, and and if you recall, uh, there was a big controversy, you know, decades later, where uh, we found out in I think was it Identity Crisis that the Justice League mind wiped Doctor Light after he attacked uh, Sue Dibney. Is that right? Was that the is it the right character? That I'm 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 trying to remember. So boy, shades of that here, I guess. Um, so I you know the uh, some of these stories just do not age well. Um, but at the end, so you know, to to bring it back to what Hippolyta was saying about Diana's strength and and whatnot, she seeks not to punish the unjust or even to imprison those who would do her harm. Although, isn't devolving the shark into uh, his earlier form is not a form of prison. I, maybe not because he doesn't remember it. Boy, we're really treading on dangerous ground here. Uh, she, uh, Princess Diana, the princess of Amazons, battles evil with weapons of love, understanding, and compassion. So is is that compassion to revert him to an earlier state of evolution? I guess. I guess, well, as 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 Diana says earlier, Coupled with his own kind, perhaps a shark will at last be content. But who is she to make that determination? I mean, I realize, you know, yeah, he was he was going to rape her, but maybe that is just. I it's just it's just boy, we're really with with today's sensibilities, we're really treading on murky ground. No matter what how you look at the story, I just I find it very par- uh, problematic. Whew. <laughs> I guess I didn't realize when I was getting into uh, this this uh, Adventure Comics number 459 what kind of moral murky ground we were getting into with some of this stuff. But it is it is a time capsule of, of ni- late 1970s superhero comic book storytelling, at least from the from the DC perspective. So what what what's coming next? <laughs> what am I in for next? I guess. But uh, anyway. I just thought was uh, I, I just I had just read this at the time of this recording. I just finished this book last night, and I could not get out of my head. I wanted to to talk about it, talk through it, and introduce you to uh, what I thought was a fun comic at first, but now I don't know. But uh, anyway, I, it's it's a bit of uh, DC Comics history that um, I'm looking forward to. Maybe not as much as I was before, <laughs> considering, but. Um, uh, looking forward to seeing what comes next, I guess. Uh, so I, I'd be very curious if you have read uh, this run of Adventure Comics, what you think of it, what you think of specifically issue number 459, starting off this Dollar Comics line uh, with all these uh, these six adventures, six features uh, that they, they started out with. Maybe I'll come back to this uh, because I know, as I, I think I said earlier, they changed this up a little bit. They didn't quite go as Paul Levitz stated. And so it might be fun to return to this down the road. Anyway, uh, if you'd like to um, send me feedback, send me some comments, uh, please do so. Email me at longboxreview at gmail.com or leave comments at the blog longboxreview.com. Or you can also, as always, uh, chat at me at Twitter on Twitter at longboxreview. So with that, I will leave you. Thanks for listening. And I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.